Good morning and welcome all to the Grand Monet House. I think uh, after yesterday evening's insightful presentations and pleasurable cocktail dinner, we are off uh, to a good start for a very productive uh, day of discussions here at the Jean Monnet House. <coughs> Uh, allow me first to introduce you to this place. Uh, Jean Monnet bought this house in 1945, right after World War II. It was here that Jean Monnet drafted the Schumann Declaration after discussing it with the French Foreign Affairs Minister who gave it his name. So here, in 1950, Europe was born, Europe uh, as we know it today. Here, the father of Europe died in 1979, almost exactly 40 years ago. So, because I just said the father of Europe, because allow me a moment of, of pride, if we hear mention of a founding father of Europe, or we hear mention of like one of the founding fathers of Europe, well, there might be doubt about who we're talking about. If we say the father of Europe, Pretty much everybody knows we're talking about Jean Monnet. Uh, and it is, it is so uh, in the sense that uh, today, Jean Monnet almost became a brand for all things European. There's the European Commission, of course, the, the Jean Monnet actions, uh, the Jean Monnet chairs throughout the, the world. So it, it has become, in a way, a brand for all things European. But who was this? father of Europe. Was he a, a politician? Was he a civil servant? Was he an entrepreneur? Well, probably not specifically any of the, of the both things, of the both mentioned things, and probably all of them at the same time. I would say that Jean Monnet, to the historian, uh, for starters, he he's a very elusive individual. <coughs> Why? because uh, he was someone who chose throughout his life, and he was instrumental to peace and unity in very many different moments of his life, not just at the moment of the human declaration. He was an individual that consistently chose to efface himself for the benefit of the goals he was working for. He didn't want the personal perceptions, the perceptions on, on his own personality, on, in others to be in the way of the goals that he had made his own and he hoped to make the goals of the collectivity. So from that point of view, for the historian, it's at the very beginning when one starts exploring the figure of Jean Monnet, it is quite difficult to make sense of the information that you are unearthing, let's say. Well, I have to say that once you go deeper and deeper, Jean Monnet is a fascinating individual with many, many layers, many uh, adventures actually uh, come, come your way when you study Jean Monnet in the sense that while he was in, 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 the, in his early youth in, in the United States, in Canada, uh, he got married in the Soviet Union. You all are going to learn a lot about that during the, the visit uh, to the museum this, this evening. But just to say now that he is, after all, a fascinating figure also when you try to learn more about, about his life, about the narrative that can be developed around uh, his life and work. But uh, just on a more also personal note, but also not connected to what we do here, let me share with you that uh, although this the first edition of, of the Taking Stock uh, of European Memory Policies event was we started that in Brussels uh, last year with Jordi Guichet, who unfortunately cannot be here today. Uh, okay, it was a successful event. It was another format, different from this year, but uh, this year, of course, uh, for us, the, 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 the fundamental uh, involvement and organization of the commission uh, means like a stepping up of, of this event and, uh, and, and, and bringing it to, to definitely to, to, to a higher level. But when we started this meeting in this kind of series of meetings, hopefully, in Brussels last year, then there was, after, after that, we thought, well, 
next year in the Jean Monnet house. And I said, of course, yes, yes, makes sense. But then I thought to myself, like, again, like Jean Monnet, a brand for all things European, we have defined since the creation of the Jean Monnet house service about a year ago, in July last year, also this place, the direct management of the European Parliament of this place, we have defined or redefined this place as a, yes, a historic house museum, but also a place, a meeting point for a public conversation on Europe, past, present, and future. So from that point of view, of course, like a meeting about memory, yeah, why not, of course, like an ideal place. But I thought I, I had to, in my own thinking, I thought I had to go deeper and justify it to myself, like, just, let's, let's say, why, why a meeting about memory policies in, in, in Jean Monnet's uh, oh, property, house, etc. Why? Well, because, as I said, he was an elusive individual, and sometimes he's perceived as someone who, in a way, despised history. How shocking, right? Because, uh, sometimes I, I, I like to say that, to me, and this is a very, very personal reflection, in a way, he tried to do with Europe what uh, collectively the French Revolution had tried to do with, with, with its society, like put the clock back to zero. And a little bit just to forget, to get rid about everything that came before, as a strategy, as a way of like making progress in uh, change, for, in favor of change. So he would say sometimes history is the excuse, it seems to me like the excuse of the people who don't feel like <coughs> acting don't feel like doing anything. So that's why it's puzzling for the historian. That's why I'm saying that it's puzzling for the historian to start off with this kind of assumptions. And, and then you need to emphasize, uh, emphasize with, with the, the, the character. But then, um, just to, in my finding of, of this, this, let's say, narrative that could make sense to say, yes, Jean Monnet memory, let me stress two very important facts. Well, one of the teachings of Jean Monnet that he mm, fought for throughout his life from his very early youth, already in World War I, so we're not talking about World War II, we're talking about World War I already. He was always appalled by the short memory of people right after the war. He was quite successful in convincing a number of individuals, of political representatives during both wars to work in a certain way. And he could prove that his advice was highly successful and was instrumental to sometimes even shortening the war or to alleviate the effects of the war. Uh, Keynes, for example, said at some point that in the case of World War II that Jean Monnet managed to shorten the war by one year. So one single individual. But he was, he was appalled by, because what made sense during the war, thanks to him, right away people would forget. And decision makers were not able to work on the same basis only one or two years after the war. So in a way, the, 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 the blueprint for European unity, the final or the ultimate blueprint, the Schumann Declaration, was a consequence of this twice at least, this, this uh, uh, um, being convinced or, or, or realizing that uh, unless something very big was happening, this mistake was bound to be repeated again and again. We work well when there's war effort, but then in peace, we don't even know where to start. So that was short memory in this, in this, in this sense. And then the second important point, it is that, well, yes, Jean Monnet was a pragmatist, definitely, but he knew in the second half of the of the 40s, he knew to recognize like a, a whole idealist movement that was unfolding then, you know, Congress of Europe in The Hague, uh, mm, European movement. Yesterday we were talking about Churchill and how he, in a way, launched the idea of, of <coughs> European unity after the war. So this idealism that was in the air, he was all almost the only one who was able to recognize that by putting, putting it to work in a very specific way, in a very pragmatic way. So in a way, he was not indifferent 
to all this more, let's say, generic uh, theoretical thinking about where do we come from, where are we headed, etc. It's just that he chose to do something with it, uh, something that was reflected upon by others, that was uh, the, the matter for, for, for like really, really thorough activism at the time, and he managed to give it a very specific shape. So that's why I think it makes full sense in more than one way <laughs> that we're here today, that uh, the Jean Monnet House hosts uh, this, this event, and uh, we hope, of course, hopefully with the help of the European Commission, of the Observatory, European Observatory for Memories, to continue this series of events in the future and to enrich uh, the, the discussions and the, the, the issues at stake uh, as, as we uh, organize more and more of, of these events in the future. Just, just to conclude, just a, a few more practical uh, words about the, the initial goals of the of, of the event, of the Taking Stock uh, event last year and, and this year. Well, we have to say that this started as a, as a network visit of the Observatory for European Memories uh, in the House of European History last year. And little by little, little we added like new layers of, of analysis, of, of, of reflection. And I think then we came up with a, a result that we were very satisfied with. And I have to say, in particular, uh, uh, thanks to the, to the presence and the contribution of the European Commission in a very specific way, in, 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 in a way of like really delivering, uh, among other things, like hard data also about programs, about the state of things, statistics. So it was, uh, in my view, a very useful exercise for analysts, but, uh, researchers, but also, of course, like uh, project managers, uh, leading uh, people from associations to actually refer to something specific in their further thinking, in their further work, know, uh, knowing that, that there, 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 there is a state of play that has been laid out, that has been communicated, and that, of course, it's up also for discussion, for you know, ex exchanges. So I think it was a very useful basis that was introduced last year. This year, and with the presence, of course, of uh, all the different organizations that are gathered here today, and thanks again to the European Commission, we are again adding another level of complexity, in a good way, of, 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 of refined work, which <coughs> is to uh, have a series of workshops to uh, go in depth with specific questions that are, I think, pressing questions for all the organizations, uh, things that need, need to be addressed, that need to be discussed. Of course, we have a very, very uh, dense, very crowded program today, so it's not just that, it's many more, but of course, for the sake of time, I'm just going to right away uh, give the floor to, to my colleagues, and I, I just want to Mm, maybe add that at the end of the, pro of, the of the discussions uh, after the conclusions that there will be a, a visit to the historic house museum I would like to stress that given also the, 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 the practical issues of you know the capacity number of people that we can um, you know mm, host in the house at the same time etc mm, we we thought we wouldn't make this, this visit compulsory. Of course, we, we <laughs> encourage all of you to, at some point, get a glimpse of the house. But I would say, like, feel free to do that during coffee breaks also, to take your own time to, again, it will be a very crowded, dense program. So I think all of us will need some moment of, like, just walking away and, like, just <laughs> breathe in the air outside, etc. Why not also, like, a quick stroll through the house? While you do that, there's interactive elements, etc. You can do your own visit also if you so desire. So feel free, please. Uh, and at the end of the day, if you feel like doing that with the group, fine. If you feel like staying also here, just like grab another coffee, chat a little bit more with, with the rest of participants, that is okay too. And that will also ease a little bit the, the organizational aspect of uh, moving around in the house. Otherwise, we're going to split the gr groups in, in, in different, different um, you know, uh, guided tours, and it will be also fine, but I just wanted to, to stress that. By the way, if you have luggage or uh, things that with you that you would like to put somewhere else, 
feel free to go to the back of the of this room. There's uh, by the restrooms. There's also an area you can. There's chairs, tables. You can just leave the stuff there or at the at the at the vestiaire at the beginning or at the, the entrance of the of the room. Also, that will also allow us to 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 move more free, freely around this space and not to be uh, encumbered by by items, uh, you know, like <coughs> suitcases, etc. Um, I think that's all for now. I'm sure uh, Ma Marie or the rest of the colleagues, as we go, and of course with the uh, presentation from uh, Gilles Pelayo, also that will be also intended to give a little bit of a wider framework to, to the things that I, I just have hinted at of like how we're going to proceed in our discussions. I'm sure many more practical elements will be communicated as we start our discussions. Thank you, Ma thank you very much and welcome again and enjoy your stay in uh, the Jean Monnet House. Let's start this table. We are not on time as you see. So I will try to be fast. Uh, but before to introduce our speakers, I would like to say today is a special day uh, because in Spain uh, the dictatorship is uh, the, the dictator Franco is being exhumated uh, from the Valle de los Caídos, the huge mausoleum next to Madrid. So it's now a challenge of European policy what to do with that space too. But to talk about challenges, European uh, policies of memory challenges now in Europe. We have all speakers today. And uh, in the first time, we have uh, Marcus Pruch, uh, his senior investigator and administrator at the European Parliament, associate professor of modern contemporary history at Heidelberg University, and a fellow of the Heidelberg Academy of Science and Humanities. He has a background in history and political science and received his PhD from the European University Institute in Florence in 2009. Between 2009 and 2012, he was a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Helsinki, funded by the European Research Council. Marcus has lectured in various countries in Europe and beyond, including the USA and Indonesia, and his work has been awarded at several occasions. His main fields of interest are European political and constitutional history, political theory and philosophy, comparative research on democracy and dictatorships, and identity studies. Thank you, Marcus. And after Marcus is going to speak, Sarah Gensburger. Is a full, she's a full professor in social science at the French National Center for the Scientific Research in Paris, CNRS. Former student of the Col Normal Supérieur, she received her PhD in sociology of memory from the EHESS, Ecole des Études en Sciences Sociales, and her habilitation in political science from Science Po Paris. Winner of the Best Dissertation Award from the French Political Science Association, her work, her work has brought the topic of memory to the field of mainstream analysis of public policies. Defended in May 2019, her habilitation dealt with the gover governmentality of memory, the social appropriations of remembrance, poli remembrance policies by citizens, and their social effects, limit, limits and black lashes. In parallel, she has also dealt with the memorialization process in the aftermath of terrorist attacks in Paris from a very original perspective. She is the author of eight books. The more recent ones are Memory on My Doorstep, Chronicles of Bataclan Big Borhut, and National Policy Global Memory, the commemoration of the righteous among the nations from Jerusa Jerusalem to Paris. And the last one, Beyond Memory, Can We Really Learn from the Past? will be released at the beginning of 2020 by Palgrave. This, books, uh, this book provides a fresh perspective on the familiar belief that memory policies are successful in building peaceful, tolerant, and inclusive society. Society's topic of importance for a round table and more broadly for today's meeting. So thank you both for coming here and Marcus as you want. Yes. <coughs> well, Richard, thank you so much for your kind words of introduction. A great thank you to the organizers of this event for having me. We are somewhat behind schedule, so let me take you through my presentation today, um, where I will try to outline a little bit the issue of uh, European historical memory as such, the possibility of such a thing, and Sarah will later rather talk about what are the effects of uh, memory policies. 
um, own people, own societies. What I will concretely do, a few words of introduction, then talking about the concept of European historical memory. What does it mean? What might it mean? Thirdly, talking about the prospects for European remembrance policies more generally and uh, finishing with some concluding remarks more on of a more personal note. And I can assure you also, you don't need to be afraid, even for, you know, I fear the institutional designation. You don't have to expect now a, a, a PR uh, activity from my side. And I will try also to be as critical as my position allows in the <coughs> context of the European Parliament, but also showing that not everything is perfect when it comes to memory policies, especially at the European Union level. First of all, however, let us summarize together what we understand by historical memory as a concept. Maybe the broadest definition we can have is that, first of all, it's a specific form of some form of collective memory, without going now into all the uh, theoretical debates about collective memory. But let's agree that it's a specific form of somehow collectively memorializing the past and in doing that, also building community <coughs> in one way or another. Thirdly, it's then about some form of collective understanding, and I put it under inverted commas, of the past, so that you can agree on certain aspects of that past in order to be really a, a form of collective memory. At the same time, and some think that seems to be forgotten, especially among historians. Historical memory is not the same as historical truth. And as historians, those of you, you know anyway that the concept of truth is not one that you really use in, in history. You know, the historical facts, but there's for sure not one historical truth. There might be different ones, different versions. And especially truth can change over time. So let's not confuse these two concepts. And because it is not <coughs> about historical truth, historical memory is in the end always about subjectivity and value judgments. They might be with the best intentions, but it's not about objectivity in the literal sense of the word. Because simply historical memory too has a somewhat functional role in societies. But because of that, we must not forget also that it's open to some form of politicization. Again, it could be with good intentions, but also with bad ones. On that note, let us go now to the issue of uh, European historical memory. The way it's often used suggests that it's, it's an established concept, and at least you can easily understand what it means. However, it's, it's maybe more complicated than that, simply for the fact that historical memory in Western societies in particular has mainly been framed in the context of nation states. Why is that important? First of all, because trying to bring it from that established national level to a supranational is already a daring attempt per se, because you have certain frictions in societies that are elementary already at national context, but they become even more important at the supranational level. So we should maybe first think about the national level and the problems historical memory already faces there, or rather the elements that are constitutive of, the, of historical memory at the national level, because they help to understand the problems of historical memory at the European level even better. First of all, we see that there is an intrinsic correlation of historical memory, on the one hand, and the nation or the state, or rather the nation building and the state building process on the other. So historical narratives are almost always deeply connected with the establishment of a nation or a nation state. Secondly, what we can learn also from the national level that the references to the past are usually not general, but very specific and selective in nature. So you memorize certain ele elements, think of the US history, you remember the Boston Tea Party maybe, but not all aspects of the long American history. And the same can be said, of course, uh, for all histories in Europe, too. Which is also clear for two reasons. Because the, pub the potential public impact is bigger when you focus on certain elements that get almost an iconic character. But it also helps to essentialize and simplify history for non-specialists. 
in the sense of, you know, you cannot expect that everyone is a historian. <coughs> so doing this has also, in a way, an educational function. But the question is, what are the repercussions of that approach to history? And that one is often a certain tendency to elevate national history and create certain myths about it. So that you, you start to somehow distort national history by focusing on very specific elements and subscribing a very specific role to that um, elements. Now, when we keep that in mind and think about European historical memory and the options one has, one could say there are essentially three at the European level. How do you deal with entrenched national histories that have those three intrinsic elements I was just describing? The first would be simply to acknowledge the diversity and parallelism of national remembrance cultures, which is maybe the easiest way forward. But it would also mean you admit there cannot be anything like a European historical memory. Secondly, is you try to base remembrance on large, I use here the Greek term topoi, such as freedom and democracy. The advantage here is it might be general enough still to bind everything together. But for that very reason, it's also somewhat non-binding way of doing it. And of course, what someone understands by democracy can vary quite a bit, as we all know. That leaves us with the third option, remembrance based on clearly defined historical <coughs> moments and events. So trying, in a way, to imitate what has happened at the nation, <coughs> which is obviously a much more binding approach to mem remembrance but also struck with all the problems national histories also face. So how can you possibly agree on common historical moments and events at the supranational level when it's already hard to do that at the national level? So that's the essential problem here. What has European remembrance policies done over the last 50, 60 years now almost? And here I should start that obviously here too, all the efforts at European level of creating something like European remembrance has been aimed at generating political legitimacy. One should be honest about that too. It's not just for the sake of understanding history better. It's also generating legitimacy for what we might call the European project. At the same time, there's maybe nothing wrong with doing that um, as well. It's about fostering something like a European sense of belonging, or let's use the the, the term even European <coughs> and traditional reference point in that endeavor have been on the one hand this broad idea of European cultural heritage the second world war more general as a negative contrast and the European integration process itself so in a way especially Chamonix the idea of an ever closer union and the success of integration as almost a point of self-referential uh, remembrance. So here we are somehow in the second group I outlined. It. So it's rather general reference points. But what we witness, especially since the 1990s, is trying to go also for the salt third alternative, namely defining very specific reference points, stronger than that was the case before. It's on the one hand <laughs> the Holocaust, on the other hand, more generally, 20th century totalitarianisms. And I put consciously the plural, and I will get back to that in a second. Let us see what the EU has been doing, and the European Parliament in particular. The main focus has been on what might be described as awareness raising political initiatives and activities. That was support for the Holocaust Remembrance Day. Obviously, as you all know, this is a day not, not just uh, commemorated at the European level. It was an international initiative, but it was a strong um, focus also of the European institutions to establish that day um, in the European Union. The European Day of Remembrance for Victims of Stalinism and Nazism, 23rd of August, the day of the signing of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, but also, most recently, the EP resolution on the importance of European remembrance for the future of Europe. Uh, just one month ago, uh, adopted by the European Parliament with a huge majority. But not without problems as well. And I don't want to get into too much detail on that 
too, because the picture might give you a bit of a distorted view when you think you have more than 500 members agreeing on it, but on a resolution, for example, that has never gone through the committee level, which was as only pushed through in two days. Anyway, just saying there are for sure initiatives to raise awareness for the importance of historical memory. Obviously, and maybe the most important European Union initiative, the Europe for Citizens program, um, on which I don't need to, to talk uh, much more because you are all very much familiar with it. But you could also say the strong advocacy for the European Year of Cultural Heritage, which we had last year, with a strong focus also on history, is a sign for keeping history alive and making it useful for understanding our uh, present and forming our future. And not least, the establishment of the House of European History in Brussels, here the Jean Monnet House, is also important <laughs> symbolic uh, things to do with regard to <coughs> historical memory. But the truth is also that there are failed initiatives. And some, you might say, they have failed in substance, but others have really failed already in terms of procedure. And I just mentioned one. There was the attempt historical memory in culture and education in the European <laughs> Union. This was the only own initiative report of the Parliament I have seen failing in the Committee on Culture and Education, and that's also telling. The only one that failed is on history, because they could simply not agree on what it might mean and where the focus should be. So also showing that it's anything but a, a simple task. Yes. That takes me now third part, prospects. What are the dilemmas? One could also say shortcomings or failings, but maybe dilemma is less provocative, of EU remembrance <laughs> policies. Maybe the biggest problem still is that we have not really one memory policy. It's rather competing memory frames. On the one hand, the idea of the singularity of the Holocaust, which represents especially Western European remembrance cultures. At the same time, the more Eastern European narrative of national socialism and communism, especially Stalinism, as equally as evil. And these two frames have not really been connected so far. They are really rather in parallel and are covered by this language of the common EU remembrance policies. And you can also see even the, the commemoration of the days I was mentioning before. While the Holocaust Remembrance Day is usually commemorated in the Western Europe very much, the 23rd of August is almost exclusively commemorated in Eastern Europe. It has not really much of a relevance in, in Western Europe. At the same time, one could also argue that it's a very teleological and reductionist understanding of history. So in a way, what, what the EU is doing, and I may be a bit mean, is you contrast a dark past with a bright present. And while this, there might be some truth to it, it's also dangerous if you stay there because it gives people the feeling, you know, everything was bad and you create just like a narrative of everything is good now. It ignores at the same time other central elements and problems of European and world history. And maybe the most obvious is colonialism that is often left out in that narrative, which had relevance essentially for all states of Europe, either because they were colonial powers themselves or they were colonialized by others. But this is an element that is almost entirely left out in, in that discourse. And finally, and somewhat paradoxically, because the European Union claims to do remembrance policies, some member states take it also as a reason why they don't have to be particularly active. Because the EU is doing the job for us, <coughs> and you have already named the real evil, national socialism, Stalinism, so all the rest seems almost not as bad as it might be. So paradoxically, the efforts at European Union level at least can have the effect as well that at least there is <coughs> less of energy <laughs> um, on the national level to really have a critical stance towards one's own history, and especially other elements <coughs> that are not covered by EU remembrance policies. So what I have been consistently arguing for is therefore <coughs> what I call a move from remembrance culture to culture of remembering. Um, and this is not a mere rhetorical exercise. It really means more <coughs> moving from content, trying to define what we should remember, more towards process. How do we approach contested histories and divisive histories? So to say, how do we create the right fora for discussing, rather than trying to agree on a common history? That would mean you can approach and you should approach Europe's past on the foundation of common core values, but 
do more than that and create open fora of discussions both within and between European nations. And a forum like this one is a good example for one of those fora, how they should look like. <laughs> People come together, they share experiences, how <coughs> to deal with complicated history and histories, but also try to find agreement how we approach those histories. It involves, however, also obviously addressing uncomfortable segments of national history in a dispassionate and open manner, not just focus on the nice elements of it. And coming back to what I said at the beginning, renouncing the notion of historical truth, at least that there is one historical truth, and that's the only one that can hold. And finally, maybe most importantly, acknowledging the risks of any remembrance policy. We should always be aware, again, even if with the best intentions, every form of policy is after all also about politics, meaning there are risks involved in all <coughs> these endeavors. And the question is indeed, should, should policymakers ever legislate on the past? So that's, that's a fundamental question we have always asked ourselves. Is it more a chance or a risk? Obviously, where I see the most important way to go forward is education policies, where it seems to be the right place to raise awareness of European diversity, both in the past and the present, to provide the necessary means to address national histories impartially and in broader trans-European and global contexts, but also encourage young citizens to become actively involved in discussing history and to contribute to an informed historical memory. You could say also civic engagement, the second strand, of Europe for citizens, in a way, can also be embodied by thinking about history. So citizenship is not just about talking about voting rights and so on, it's also about discussing history and remembrance. So obviously <coughs> the ways to do it are curricula and principles of teaching, pedagogy, but also for the multiplayer effect alone, teacher training. So these are the two ways to do, and you see obviously already in both fields there are essentially no competences for the European <laughs> Union. So this is a task of the member states and not a difficult one, because it's also about the understanding, self-understanding of nations, history teaching and history in general. So to have changes in those fields is not easy, but that shouldn't be taken as an excuse for not doing it. Maybe very briefly, like political recommendations that have been formulated also by the, by the Committee on Culture and Education in the European Parliament, very general ones. Um, I just take you through what, what should be done is recognize historical memory as an elusive concept. It seems obvious for those that deal professionally with it, but it's not necessarily so for historians. Secondly, raise awareness for the difficulties of historical memory in general, but especially a trans-European historical memory. It's not an easy thing to be done. Thirdly, acknowledge that there, there is something to build more efforts in this field on, like the Europe for Citizens program. But also admitting that there are shortcomings when it comes to current EU memory policies and that more <coughs> needs to be done. That we should go for a European culture of remembering as a first step to form a remembrance culture. So we have to think first about process, how methodology, rather than talking about content. At the, at the political level. We have to acknowledge the central role of education uh, and we should make strategic use of the European means, financial and otherwise, to support national policies because most of that has mm -hmm. to take place at the national level. But again, European funding programs mm -hmm. and initiatives can mm -hmm. help to do that. That takes me to my last uh, slide. Some conclusions. What I have witnessed now in, in the eight years in the European Parliament responsible for culture and education policies and being particularly interested in, in remembrance policies is that there is still a huge gulf between history, academic history and politics. The sense of that the discourses are not at all compatible and that it's often very hard to mediate between these two, two areas. Secondly, that what I call that the aspiration, what we want to <coughs> achieve, very noble, very <coughs> ambitious, is often in conflict with the reality, which shows that still at national level, some 95% of history textbooks are on explicitly on national history. 
So it seems we are talking at that level and, and still reality is somewhat there. And even attempts for B national history textbook, you know, they are really still it's happening at a very low, low level. So again, more needs to happen in reality. I don't think we are lacking ambitious ideas, but to put that into practice is the real challenge. We have what I mentioned before, these competing memory frames in Europe. They still need further putting together. We have this focus on teleology and reductionism that needs to be overcome. And of course, we have this ever-present conflict between the European and the national level, with member states being particularly keen not to have too much Europe in how they have to approach history. And I think finally also, however, that maybe sometimes at the political level there are certain misconceptions. First, about European historical memory. It's really the idea we can agree on one element that all Europeans can believe in or find awful. And that's really a strong misconception. I'm deeply convinced that it doesn't work. But another misconception is, I think, even more generally about European citizenship. The idea of we need citizens that think the same way. While I think it should be about citizens that manage to think about the same problems. Or to put it in a, in a picture, we can have our national identities, forms of remembering the past, but nothing keeps us from seeing them also through a European lens. On that note, thank you for your attention. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks, Marcus, for this. I'm going to use it because, uh, as you heard, I'm a little bit ill, so I want everyone to be able to hear me. Uh, as I was saying, thank you, Marcus, for this um, great presentation, and I think quite critical, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so, uh, in a way, I think your presentation is more from the politics level, mm. and I will be more grassroots level, mm. so I, I hope the two will have an, an interesting dialogue. And I will try to be short because I want, I'm even more interested in what you have to say, being mm. practitioners of memory, than I being a scholar, so it's in a way not that interesting. Um, and also I must to, to state that I was not last year at the Brussels meeting and I heard that some data was, were collected and presented, so I'm very much interested by that. And I will try to bring some data into the discussion. Maybe not that statistic, but more ethnographic ones, <coughs> since I think it's also something we need to value at some point. So I will start by uh, acknowledging that memory is indeed a European value. I will uh, refer to only one study as an introduction. In 2014, in a large survey study called uh, Memory to Come, more than 30,000 young people aged between 16 and 29, coming from more than 30 different countries, mostly from the European Union, were questioned about their attitudes to memory and the future. In a way, this culture of remembering mm -hmm. you were referring to. And 90% of them declared that knowing the history of the Second World War makes it possible to avoid the error of the past, prevent it from happening again. They also agreed with the statement that knowing this history allowed them to learn to respect those who are different from us and help the victims. And among the respondents, 83% said they thought concentration camp sites should be preserved. And the main, the main reason given for this was the need to avoid it happening again. And conversely, they rejected the proposition that is it the past, we have to put it behind us and forget. In the same way, comments by ordinary European citizens are concordant with this, whether they are collected from memorial sites, museums, or um, doing interviews as I did and some colleagues did uh, with ordinary people, asking them what do they think about the past, what do they think about history. And so I think the data are clear there. We can say that memory is a new European value and that the culture of remembering you were speaking of does exist. So this is the first things that can be acknowledged. 
But as important as it may be, this fact doesn't not tell us anything about the actual capacity of memory policy to transmit and promote values being the one of memory. Because the reason why the memory became a European value is because we think speaking about the past can promote European democratic values such as dialogues, coexistence, tolerance, democracy. And this relation between these values and the value of memory are not that clear from grassroots data. And even more, I will say that um, today evolution of European politics may challenge the idea that memory are really linked to these democratic values. Um, despite the active um, European memory policies at the transnational level or at the national level for the last 20 years, we see the rise of hate crimes, populism, um, discrimination in most of contemporary European societies. And this forced us to look more closely into how these memory policies actually work and how, how we can improve them. Um, I will start by telling you the story of a memory exhibition. So we may all agree that the First World War may be one of the major historical uh, European events. And between 2014 and 2018, the centenary of the Great War gave birth to a large number of commemoration, exhibition, memory initiatives, and so on. In the European Union, most of the exhibitions tried to present the event as a European event and tried to give um, views of the other part, of the enemies. Not only, for example, the exhibition in France did not present only the French point of view, but really were willing to include the other point of view, the German ones, of course, and more broadly, other European countries. Um, one of these exhibitions, entitled uh, 14 to, uh, 18, it is our story, took place in Brussels. Maybe some of you went, mm -hmm. or you went, maybe? Mm -hmm. Yeah? And maybe it was uh, uh, supported by the European Parliament, I don't know. Uh, it's aimed at telling the story of the war from an everyday life per perspective and at transforming visitors through emotions. The curators base themselves on the idea that when confronting with the impact of war on victims, visitors could identify themselves with the victims and then reject wars and conflicts for today and for the future. Through the exhibition, its promoters wanted to reinforce citizen commitment to peace and in doing so their adhesion to the European project. The exhibition was visited by almost 200,000 visitors. And a group of Belgian researchers, some colleagues and friends, decided to study the impact of this exhibition actually had on visitors. Visitors were asked to express their opinions on a certain number of criteria when they entered and left the museum. These measures are traditionally used in psychosocial uh, analysis, trying to quantify pacifist sentiments in social psychology. And the results were very clear. As they left the exhibitions, the visitors demonstrated decreased support for pacifism and an increased one in nationalistic stereotypes. <laughs> in other words, most of them have gained determination to fight the Germans. Instead of pacifism and European coexistence intended, the exhibition focused on both raw emotions and figures of victims, provoked a defensive reaction and a form of desire for vengeance against the other, here mainly the German. It's Belgium and German, but it can work on any other topics, of course. Um, even if empirical studies of social appropriations of memory policies like this one, are still very rare, the few existing ones raise important questions about how to move forward as long as European memory policies are concerned. And in my opinion, if I can participate in this data issue discussion, I will call the European Commission and the Euro European Parliament to order more in-depth study of um, the social appropriations of remembrance policy and initiatives by ordinary citizens from rejections to support. And by saying that, I don't say we must judge this citizen. We just must um, look into depth how they, what they do with the past, what they do with uh, all these narratives that uh, we are giving them to work with. Um, for the sake of 
two-day roundtable, and based on the few existing studies, several dimensions may already be taken into consideration, in my opinion. The first one um, would be, and I agree with you, you, you uh, refer to this point, if memory has become a European democratic value, it is, however, impossible to know for sure, and even more to control, what kind of values and political stance are induced by memory. For example, all the studies of what is called in uh, uh, scientific literature historical analogies shows that this very same fact can be interpreted and given a political meaning very different depending on who deals with it. And now I think, so I'm not a politician so I can say it, for example, the, the very diverse reaction mobilization of the Holocaust European memory in regards of the migrant crisis mm -hmm. It's a very good example of that. I th I'm sure several of you um, work on teaching human rights through Holocaust history. Where, what, what does it mean? Which kind of human rights? How do, does you make sense today based on Holocaust? Where it, does it start? Where does it end? And this, you, can re you cannot really um, know it before you do it and before you interact with people through this issue of Holocaust memory in the perspective of human rights. Um, moreover, the, stu the few studies that exist show that it is easier to reinforce norms in groups that are already predisposed to them that to convince people who are generally intolerant and simply indifferent. Mm -hmm. um, in this way, we could say that rather than transmitting values, memory policy first of all actualize values which pre-exist in people's minds, no matter how diverse <coughs> they are. And this is the idea of risk you referred to. Mm -hmm. It may seem paradoxical, but it is important to acknowledge that to be efficient, an active memory policy have to take the risk of misunderstandings, and for this reason should not be too didactical in order to avoid, to avoid to be counterproductive. Even more, some studies conducted in Sweden and France show that if you want to use Holocaust memory, for example, <coughs> to um, change people from far-right opinion, it may have <coughs> counterproductive <coughs> results. It may reinforce their adhesions to um, uh, racism, anti-Semitism, um, hate of the other, and so on. The second point I want to, to bring into the discussion today, uh, and I think it's the main aspect to, to take into consideration for moving forward with this issue, is that if memory are about the past and are for the future, they always take place through interactions in the present. Memory is indeed appropriated through social interactions, rejections of support, recognition or interpretation. Also, they are faced with the past. Both the promoters and targets, targets of the European memory policy must first experience things, school textbooks, exhibitions, memorials, or exchanges between students and teachers, between state or union representative and citizen, between NGO and people, and so forth. And these interactions are going to play a huge role on the way this memory content is going to be interpreted and make sense. Um, in, this, in such interactions, memorial message is by nature, nature distorted because it is always embedded in social relations, which include not only cultural dimensions, but economic inequalities, symbolic domination, mm -hmm. of course, gender issues, uh, any kind of power relations that will give meaning to memory. And in my opinion, a large field, I, I'm one of the creators of the Memory Studies International Association, so I know what I'm speaking about, but even in, in scientific literature, all these dimensions are all often left aside, and we only focus about culture, but culture in a way doesn't exist um, separated from all this embeddedness of social interactions. Mm -hmm. Um, and I will take one example linked to the issue of teachers. Mm -hmm. So, as you said, um, the uh, January 27 <coughs> day is an European day of commemoration of the Holocaust and preventi preventing genocide and uh, mass crimes. And 
In France, for example, you have an official document by the Ministry of Education to all the teachers to say, you need to do something to celebrate it, you need to, <coughs> to do something with it in class. But they don't. Yeah. It's not because they don't care about the Holocaust or they don't care about raising good citizens for the future. Of course they do, they are teachers, uh, any teachers do, it's why they are teachers. But they just don't do because it doesn't fit with the culture of education in France. Uh, in France, everything about education is about evaluation, rates, um, classification between students, going in the, in the good track and not the bad track. And so this is not at all in the culture of the teachers. So I, I think this issue of putting everything on the teacher is something that must be taken very seriously in terms also on, profi um, on professional culture of each of the national uh, teaching education. Um, and if you stay at the issue of, at the level of sc the school systems, every field work studies show that when you teach history, when you teach memory, of course you are teaching memory, but this teaching is always taken into the way you have relationship between students and teachers, between students themselves, and again, the differences between students, the inequalities between students, the power relations <coughs> between students, <coughs> and, um, and the roles that each, each of the students are playing in the class. So this unconscious can give memory policies great strengths. For example, when a student who wants to fulfill the expectation of the teacher or of this family identifies with an eyewitness account of history and finds fulfillment in this role that brings together academic, civic, and moral validation. But the proliferation of background noise that is normal in any social relation can also mean that the message in spite of its clear strength, will not be heard, or that it will prove, provoke hostility. So the importance of these socially embedded dimensions of memory policy impact and appropriations call for a displacement of the center of attention, in my opinion. It may not be efficient to only focus on reference points, or contents, topics, or even artifacts of European memory policies, as it has be mainly been the case until now, in it is necessary to pay at least equal attention to social situation into which transmission is made to take place and also to the identity and legitimacy of the agents of this transmission. This is maybe the most important thing. And if I come back to teachers, I don't know, in European society where schools do not play their role anymore in terms of fighting uh, in economic inequalities, promoting social justice, maybe teachers may not be the best um, actors for answering an active and efficient transmission of memory and democratic values. I'm not saying that, I'm just raising the question, I, I think it must be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. And also in terms of legitimacy, you referred to legitimacy in your presentation and you're right, it's, it's something crucial. Um, but there is kind of paradox because the European Union must want to use memory policies and she's right to do that. Uh, as a way to foster its legitimacy. But the lack of its legitimacy is also a way to bring negative mm. dimension to this memory transmission. So you have to n navigate between these two. So maybe one of the things we could think of altogether is try to, to think which um, best actors of memory transmission has to pick picked in terms of legitimacy, uh, repre also representativeness. Um, and I will take a last example to highlight in which way taking seriously the social embeddedness of memory policies may be the main challenge for European memory policies today. For a long time now, Europe has developed holiday camps or programs that bring together adolescents from countries whose memories are conflicting or were conflicting starting a long time ago with France and Germany, yeah. to help them overcome hostile memories. And of course, all of us, we would like to believe that um, whole societies could be step by step won over to peace and toler tolerance by this contact between presumed enemies. 
But again, uh, sociological studies show that it's more complicated. These young people are not official representatives of their national or community groups. They are also members of social groups, possibly the recipients of their parents' political allegiances and above all individuals who take either side of conflicts or friendship in their interactions with others. What is created within the safe space of the camps or programs is not easily transposed into a society that is deeply de divided or belligerent or again uh, unequal in terms of economic uh, situations. Friendship constructed in conditions of relative equality are threatened by the everyday experience of inequality and differences. And sociologists have shown that the criteria for equality are not always satisfied. So equality found in a combined curriculum or the opulence of a holiday camp cannot be guaranteed when they return to their real life. Worse still, the contact itself between different social groups could end up reinforcing logics of social distinction, stereotypes, and detachment. Which happens, for example, if the teacher or other authority figure imposes a meeting between individuals <coughs> belonging to unequal groups without ensuring that these inequalities do not determine perceptions or are not expressed with contempt, which is not easy to do, of course. The transmission of the violent past in which victims and culprits both feature can reinforce sometimes the assigned community identities that it is supposed to overcome. So to conclude, I will say that taking stock of European memory policy today passes by taking seriously the complexity of the social appropriation of the past and that it is important to prevent the danger of disconnecting the status of memory as European value from its effectiveness as a tool for promoting tolerance, <coughs> inclusiveness, equality, and emancipation. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, if you want to ask some questions to our speakers, now is the moment. So, Bruno. Thank you very much for this two presentation. It was food for thought. Uh, I have two comments on your presentation, Marcus. It was really useful. Thank you very much once again. Uh, your proposal to renounce to the notion of historical truth. What we all do in these rooms is to provide a multi perspective history, of course. However, it doesn't mean to deny the role of historical truth. There is a culture of remembrance in Turkey, there is a culture of remembrance in France or in Belgium, and there is one historical truth based on the work of the historians, the, the genocide of the Armenians. Mm -hmm. Just one example. Mm -hmm. I mean, we cannot oppose it, the two notions, and that for me, it means something, the notion of historical truth. It's not something coming from one perspective, this is based on the work of the international historian on a few topics. There is an historical truth about the Holocaust, about the crime of the Stalinists, about the genocide of the Armenians. Uh, second point, uh, the initiative of the European Parliament. You have indicated two <coughs> events, especially the one related to the Declaration of Prague. Mm -hmm by the declaration of the recognition of 23rd of August. Mm -hmm. What we all do in this room, uh, once again, is to build up the common houses. Mm -hmm. What did the European Parliament on this day is just to divide the European nations mm -hmm. and the groups of experts. Mm -hmm. My daily work is to repair, and I really would like to stress this point, mm -hmm. what happened during this day, because there is no opposition to work on the, uh, the Stalinist crimes and to work on the Holocaust. And by making an equalization, it did not help the both issues, mm -hmm. they just fed the gap between European, Eastern countries and Western countries. Mm -hmm. And the second lead us, uh, this equalization in a sense, mm -hmm. lead us unfortunately to a second uh, not accurate initiative, which was a very fantastic project the house of European history, mm. because it leads to the same interpretation as well, equalizations and nothing to do with the singularity of the Holocaust. Mm. So just to stress that the European Parliament do a fantastic job 
but he has to evaluate sometimes his own initiative. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> Should I? Maybe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. yeah, no, no, just saying. I mean, I, I absolutely agree on, on your second point, that what has happened is in many cases rather reinforcing the problem than, than solving it. And I have also to say it's, well, how to put it? I think it was a bit of an alibi measure too, saying, look, rather than trying really to sit together, have a critical discussion. You know, you get your day, we have ours, and then everyone is happy, the box is ticked. Now I'm a bit exaggerating maybe, but they don't see the consequences that, that that might produce. And this is just a pseudo agreement, because as I tried to outline, I still think, as you say, there are essentially two conflicting visions that have not been reconciled. In defense of our politicians, however, I also should say, it's, it's not an easy task. When you hear like discussions, I, I mean, I remember in, also in the cult comedy when we had these resolutions a few years ago, essentially the one fraction say, History is too important to leave it to uh, politicians. But then you had the other view. History is too important to leave it to historians alone. Mm -hmm. So that's already a fundamentally in the sense of how to deal with it. Then we had discussions of the kind of, yes, those two totalitarian regimes were equally as bad. And then something, no, but Stalin was after all better than Hitler because he was fighting Hitler. I mean, sometimes discussions are taking place at that level. So you can imagine how difficult it is also to find a solution. And I think then sometimes the easy way is taken out, saying simply, OK, we leave it at that, and then we are not talking about it anymore. So I will, I'm glad to take that back um, to, to Brussels and Strasbourg and also tell our politicians that you know, there is this sense that what, what the parliament is doing is not necessarily helpful, always. On the other point, just quickly, historical truth. Of course, I didn't want to challenge as such that, you know, there are historical facts and things that has happened. I see the problem more when politicians use the term historical truth, because then it's usually meant in the sense of your argument has no value because mine is the dominant one. So I, I meant more the use of historical truth at the political level, because that's usually imposing a specific view on others, not necessarily at the academic. Even for as a historian, I would also rather prefer to, to use the term historical facts than historical truth, because truth has all these philosophical meanings and implies a little bit, you know, there cannot even be a different view on, on a certain fact. But, but I take that point. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent Ashley from Documenta. Thank you for uh, your reflections. Uh, I would uh, just want to propose that we really insist on historically established facts and judicially established facts. Because what is happening is really that in uh, distorting what happened, this is, this is really, I think, a rock on which uh, we could uh, base what we do. And, uh, you know, just mentioning that, okay, historical truth might be a political term, but here we are now speaking about what we are going to propose uh, also to Commission and to Parliament. So my proposal for discussion in the workshops would be, are these rocks on which we can base uh, our memory for uh, then historically established facts and uh, judicially established facts? because for uh, wars uh, in then Yugoslavia between 1991 to 2001, uh, the judicially established facts are very important. Of course, there will be additional historical verification, but I would uh, pledge that historically uh, and judicially established facts are mentioned because this is so useful and genocide in Srebrenica is so frequently being uh, questioned lately. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, this is our last <laughs> question because we are not on time. So if you want to undo it, I'm sorry. Yeah, yes. we can discuss During now. the coffee, I'm sorry because it's really late. So we'll go on later. Thanks a lot for your uh, your intervention. Thanks a lot for being here. So.
Let's close it. Thank you. I just you. wanted to mention also, since I will need to leave earlier, if there are any questions, so please get in touch with me so to discuss, or if any one of you I I is in Brussels, <laughs> just as an off. Sorry? Sure, by all means, yes. So just my apologies that I will not be able to stay for much longer, but please contact me, and I'm, I'm glad to, to hear, and I wish you all the best. I think it's really the work you do that is the one I think that should ideally be done by many more people. So, so a great thank you also on behalf of the Parliament. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Do you hear me? I've got a bit of a, a sore throat, so uh, I hope that uh, the mic works. Um, my name is Gilles Pelayo. I, I'm the head of the, the unit, the team uh, managing the uh, Europe for Citizens program uh, at uh, the uh, executive uh, agency, uh, Education, Audiovisual and Culture. I'm here with uh, uh, Isabel Eitinger, whom uh, probably many of you uh, know. Just, uh, just a bit of a disclaimer and a warning compared to the uh, presentation that we've just had. When we're going to lose a bit of altitude. Uh, I'm sorry, so, you know, fasten your seat belt and you can try to, to do this because the, uh, we're going to get more, much more operational for a moment just before the, the, the coffee break. Um, as, the, uh, as the program indicates, uh, for a moment, uh, we're going to focus a bit on implementing the projects supported by the, the Europe for Citizens program, uh, some kind of... Uh, guidelines, questions, and uh, an answer. Um, just a bit of presentation of the agency, because you've been in contact uh, with us. I mean, you're, you're beneficiaries. Uh, so we, we are working on behalf of the, uh, of the European Commission, together with our colleagues from the, uh, the Commission services on, uh, on managing uh, uh, many programs. Uh, some of them, you know, well known, Erasmus+, Plus, Creative Europe, Media, uh, Culture. As far as the uh, Europe for Citizens program is, um, is concerned, uh, every year our team deals with uh, close to uh, 2,000 um, applications and we, um, we select something like three, uh, 300 of, um, of them. Uh, that uh, represents, uh, for remembrance, entry 300. Um, around 1,502 uh, 2,000 organizations mobilizing um, every year on these issues of uh, European remembrance. So uh, it is, uh, it shows, it evidences, uh, you know, a lot of mobilization uh, across the, the continent on, uh, on those issues. So, uh, I mean, the, the, the topics that we have discussed uh, today uh, really are uh, underpinned by, uh, by a lot of actions and initiatives and, uh, and, uh, and projects all across the continent, and I think it's quite comforting to, uh, to, to note this. Uh, if you are here in the room, you are uh, sort of survivors of the selection process, so uh, uh, congratulations for this, because the, um, the success rate is, uh, is quite, uh, quite low. I mean, from one perspective, it's good because uh, uh, we select only uh, the, the, the very best projects, and, uh, and, um, and thank you for this. But on the other hand, we know uh, it has sometimes some, uh, some uh, detrimental effect of discouraging some, uh, some local actors to, uh, to apply. Uh, the uh, success rate improved uh, this year to uh, 17.17% from 10% in 2018, but still it remains, um, it remains uh, quite, uh, quite low. Just to, uh, to enter into the, the, the matter, um, your projects uh, have been selected, I mean, uh, basically, that's, uh, that's quite banal because they correspond to the award criteria. I will just still uh, take uh, some minutes to, um, uh, to uh, underline uh, uh, why you have been uh, selected uh, in terms of, uh, of those uh, award criteria because I think it's, uh, it's important to hi highlight uh, the spirit in which we, we expect the projects to be uh, to be implemented, and uh, some of the aspects resonate with uh, with what uh, 
uh, what the two distinguished professors um, uh, underlined before. So first, uh, and it's the most uh, obvious, uh, let's say, uh, uh, the, the, the projects that, uh, that you presented to us are coherent with the, the program of objectives. So uh, we operate uh, not in a legal vacuum, let's say, but we have this legal basis. The co-legislators, the political authorities determine the, the core objectives of the, of the program and uh, that's what we uh, together uh, need to, uh, to implement and to respect. And so th there's the question of the values, you know, the, the, the reflection on the, the core European values, uh, such as liberty, democracy, the rule of law, peace. So um, to echoing what Marcus uh, presented, that's, that's very much uh, at the forefront of, um, of what we, we support through the Remembrance Project, particularly in this, at this moment, I would say, of, uh, of the, the history of the, of the European Union. Then there is the purely uh, remembrance aspect, I would say, of keeping the, the memories ali uh, alive on, on the causes and consequences of the, uh, the European totalitarian regimes, regimes uh, uh, in, the, in the plural, and to commem commemorate the, um, the victims. And then we have the even more commemorative dimension of the, uh, the days of European significance, and to which every year we update um, these um, these dates and these uh, these moments. Uh, uh, last year, I mean, uh, in 2018, we had a very good projects on the end of the, of the First World War and uh, its aftermath. Uh, this year, for instance, we had a uh, lot of projects uh, on the um, end of the Spanish Civil War, the beginning of uh, the Second World War. Uh, there are always, uh, let's say, uh, good occasions to to focus attentions and studies and actions on uh, on different uh, moments. At a more concrete level, uh, obviously, uh, we have selected your, your projects uh, and to, to be very pedestrian because of, the, uh, of their appropriate activity plan. But uh, uh, let's say beyond the technicalities, uh, I think it's uh, important to come back on the issue of, uh, of, of the nature of, the, of our program, Europe for Citizens. And uh, again, that, that resonates with what has been said with the question of uh, legitimacy and let's say the remembrance uh, strand is within the Europe for Citizens program because uh, primarily it's a question of uh, a political question of citizenship of creating uh, a European demos let's say uh, through partly through uh, remembrance so uh, the activity plan uh, of the projects we support uh, provide a way to empower uh, citizens to mobilize uh, civil society to, to bring discussion on, on Europe, discussion, and it's not a kind of a, a, a unique way of looking at Europe that we promote, but uh, bring it at the, at the local level and let the, the, voice, the voices uh, of citizens be, uh, be expressed and be heard uh, by, the, uh, by the institutions. So that's a, a very important comp component of, uh, of what we support. And uh, so I encourage you to pay particular attention to this aspect in implementing your, your project. Um, of course, um, we, we look at the uh, uh, exploitation and dissemination of the, the results. That's an important dimension of, um, of what we do. Uh, the challenge is to, to reach uh, a wider audience than those, let's say, concerned immediately or those who go uh, spontaneously uh, towards this information. It's particularly the case in the remembrance trends. And the, the challenge uh, that we see uh, in the projects we select or not is uh, the way in which uh, citizens that are not already uh, immediately sensitive or um, who have access to, to those issues are, are rich. So uh, let's say uh, most probably your project has been selected thanks to the, the particular efforts you do in this respect. And, and we really encourage you to, um, to, um, to continue in this direction. Um, we, we support projects with uh, strong partnerships. Uh, strong partnerships, I don't mean only, uh, you know, uh, long-lasting, solid uh, partnership with a coherence on objective, but also we, we like projects with a, 
a variety and a richness of uh, organizations involved, which means you know civil society organizations it can be uh, museums in the case of uh, of the Remembrance Trust, uh, academic organization. Um, in our experience, the um, the best projects are those mixing uh, this uh, diversity of uh, of approaches in order to. Uh, to, to best contribute to uh, a citizen's uh, appropriation of, um, of those um, issues. And then there's the question of the, the uh, European outreach. Uh, one workshop will work on the uh, uh, European dimension. Uh, and uh, that's, a, that's a, let's say a big topic in itself. There are many ways for a project to be uh, European, let's say. Some very local projects are, are selected because uh, they demonstrate well that they have a, a European relevance. Some projects are, let's say, European because uh, they deal with an issue that's, uh, that's obviously uh, transnational, uh, let's say, or they have a, a variety and a great number of partners at the, at the European level. I'm uh, quite curious to see um, what uh, what the workshop on the European dimension will uh, will come up with is by the way it's uh, Isabel moderating uh, that uh, that workshop. So voila, I just wanted to insist on the on those aspects uh, to uh, encourage you as uh, beneficiaries of uh, of the program. So most of you in uh, in this room to uh, to build on those uh, strengths in your uh, projects. Uh, then uh, some. Um, let's say, uh, even more uh, concrete uh, recommendations, so to speak, tips and, uh, and tricks for a successful project uh, implementation from start to finish. I mean, you have passed the first uh, stage of uh, project implementation as part of the remembrance strand, but um, uh, after selection, what makes for uh, a successful uh, project uh, uh, implementation? Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, acknowledge and uh, salute, so to speak, your commitment because we are well aware in the agency of the uh, difficulties and challenges that, uh, that you face uh, every day in the implementation of uh, your activities. The topics uh, that you are uh, dealing with uh, and uh, the public uh, you want to, to, to reach Make, make it difficult. It's a kind of permanent uh, effort um, about, uh, about uh, which we are uh, uh, well aware. In some countries even, uh, those are very uh, politically charged, uh, sensitive issues. Uh, in almost every country, by the way. Uh, I don't have in mind of any um, EU country or uh, countries in the, in the Western Balkans where uh, dealing with um, remembrance and memory issues wouldn't be uh, you know sensitive per se so i just wanted to to stress this so uh, we we try to show understanding about this uh, we mentioned uh, the the issue of education and the importance of education the uh, difficulties of uh, education uh, has been uh, mentioned before uh, many of your projects uh, aim at involving the younger generation of course for remembrance it's a natural uh, uh, target uh, to to let's say uh, to 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 engage the the young generation, um, and we uh, and we know that uh, that's a, a tough order. The the young people are not uh, necessarily easy to engage outside the classroom. Uh, um, uh, you 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 showed us how even in the classroom, you know, uh, doing it correctly is difficult. But still, um, we, we do support the, uh, your efforts at, uh, at engaging the, the young generation. In fine, if I may say, uh, uh, and very, very concretely uh, before the, the coffee break, uh, what, do you, what do we expect from you in terms of the implementation of the, the project? Um, it, sounds, it sounds a bit uh, kind of basic, um, but uh, first, I would stress the need to implement the product as described in the project application, sorry for uh, underlining it, even if, of course, we totally uh, are open to, uh, to changes. We know that the, the projects need to adapt, circumstances change, sometimes uh, partners uh, uh, drop out. Uh, the, uh, the name of the game here is just to, to keep us posted as much as possible in advance. I mean, uh, we are generally... Um, 
very, very uh, understanding as an executive agency provided that we are told in advance, but uh, anticipation and uh, uh, permanent information is really the, the name of the game to avoid uh, uh, problems um, at, uh, at the, the final report stage. Generally speaking, uh, of course, uh, all your obligations are described in the contract, uh, general, uh, general conditions, but uh, never hesitate to come back to us if you have a doubt in implementing uh, those who are, you know, we reckon sometimes in, uh, in obscure uh, legalistic uh, language, we are used to, uh, to answering questions on, the, um, on how to best implement the, uh, the contract uh, provision. The, the very simplified forms of uh, financing that we have for the uh, action grants and also for the operating grant, by the way, um, make it generally, uh, you know, easy, uh, the, the, the budget aspects. Uh, one point, uh, however, is that uh, basically uh, our benchmark is the number of participants to events and where they come from. Uh, we do not need at the final report stage to, to have this evidence of uh, uh, who how many people came from where, etc. But just in case of uh, potential follow-up controls, uh, exposed audits, etc., all those evidences should be very carefully kept uh, by you and at the ready in, in case we, we need it. Uh, I, I mention this because, uh, you know, it, it is our experience of the sort of pathology of uh, project implementation that, that, uh, that uh, let's say, leads me to, to stress this, um, this dimension and we absolutely want to uh, prevent any, um, any problem. There's a question of the dissemination and visibility clause. Uh, Acknowledging the, you know, the support of, uh, of, the, uh, of the European Union, etc. Ensuring the visibility of your project and, and of the EU support is important for the, the sustainability of the program also. Uh, uh, it's important that, uh, uh, that this, uh, this program and particularly its remembrance strand who, uh, who, uh, who is, you know, uh, relatively limited in size <coughs> and, and very precious to, uh, to many of you is uh, visibly making a, a kind of difference on the ground because uh, in terms of you know, our political masters in the council, in the member states, in the European Parliament, they need to, they need to see that, um, that uh, the, um, the European programs are, uh, are making a difference on the ground. And, uh, and that the EU support is acknowledged. I say this, uh, as I always say, I don't, I'm not marketing a product, I'm not a salesman for a, a, a Coca-Cola or a toothpaste company, I don't have any interest in having publicity. I think it's just a question of mutual sustainability um, if, uh, if our program is, uh, is uh, well uh, visible, then it, it, uh, let's say it will continue and, and might even grow, which, is, uh, which will be beneficial for, um, for both of us, so to speak. Uh, in terms of contact and, uh, and visibility, by the way, it's always of, uh, of good practice, and I, I know that a lot of, uh, of you do it already, to, to liaise as appropriate with the contact points of our, of our program. Uh, I, I trust and uh, I believe that you've been in, in touch with our <coughs> national contact points and also with the um, uh, representations of the European institutions on the ground where you operate, be it from the Commission or the, the European Parliament. It's, uh, it's good to have this... Uh, this uh, this connection the representation offices of the parliament of the commission have a more political role in the in the eu member states or the eu delegations in the western uh, balkans and so uh, it's good also for the visibility i've just mentioned that they be um, in the loop um, reporting is um, finally is an important dimension of uh, of your work uh, it's important uh, not only for the very, uh, you know, concrete uh, um, objective of releasing final payments, etc. For us, it's a very important uh, input, uh, not only to, to make sure that, uh, that the, the, the projects we support have been implemented according to, to plan, but it's also uh, food for thought for the design of, um, of the program in the, uh, in the future. 
So, um, so the the recommendation I would uh, I would make the final recommendation would be to um, to do it uh, and prepare it, uh, you know, as a, as the project goes, and to really uh, document the, the whole life of the uh, of the the project. Uh, we we welcome. Uh, uh, all the photos, all the testimonies, uh, everything that uh, that can make it uh, as concrete as um, as possible to us. Obviously, we uh, uh, we as much as we can participate into events uh, of the the projects we support, but we uh, absolutely cannot be uh, uh, everywhere uh, uh, and uh, at all the events of our projects. We've got too many um, every year, and we are too few. Uh, our team is only twenty persons uh, for. Um, for hundreds of uh, of projects uh, every year, so um, so in a nutshell, that that was it. Uh, I am at your disposal uh, now and today, together with uh, with Isabel, uh, to uh, to answer any query you would have on the uh, actual uh, implementation of uh, of the projects. And again, uh, congratulations for having made it uh, through the the selection. And uh, my best wishes for uh, a sound and, uh, and a successful implementation of, uh, of the projects. <laughs> Any question? Is that at your disposal? Eh? In any case, if you have any... Uh, ah, there. There, and then, yeah. Madam? Maybe we take straight away the question. <coughs> well, Heidi Meinzelt, um, we have a project, Women and Web Peace, and uh, I think when you talk about uh, food for thought, I would rather prefer more uh, decentralized information also of the, the different projects. This might be a good occasion in the workshops now, but also in a kind of database for the future. I think these thoughts are very important, of course, for the institutional level, but also on the, the grassroots level to exchange experiences and uh, different approaches, as we heard also this morning, uh, the importance of uh, having really um, also this, uh, yeah, the, the embedded social interaction, as you said, for example, and all these different levels, and uh, to develop further on also uh, an online presentation of the project where we can do continue our research on the academic and also on the educational level as such. This would be a great um, tool, and I hope that in the in the workshops we really can use it also as a kind of exchange of our experiences um, from the grassroots level uh, in order to learn from each other a little bit more. Thank you. You know what, maybe? I think, no, I, I will take the mic. I think it works better than mine, no? Okay. Ah, yeah, I think it's better. Yeah, thanks. Um, dissemination of the, the results and networking, yeah, uh, absolutely. Let's say, I mean, the, a, workshop, a workshop like this has also, uh, you know, a very useful and uh, it's a power powerful uh, uh, networking purpose. On the results of the, um, of the projects, um, we already have 
the database of the, the project uh, available on the web. Uh, by the way, uh, we have in the, the past couple of years also um, improved the, the content of what we put there in the sense that before we would put the summary of the project as you would submit them to us at the application stage. And uh, some of you might have noticed that now uh, in the final reports we ask more uh, information to put on the, the said website on impact, on actual implementation of the projects because in a way what matters more than the uh, um, operational plans is to put uh, uh, you know what what's been done uh, concretely uh, from the project. What were the results? So that's what we uh, upload now in our um, let's say projects uh, database. And uh, uh, I can even announce that now we will upgrade let's say the quality and uh, uh, and uh, the quantity of information that we will uh, we'll put out um, in uh, on the web because we will use the um, enhanced, let's say, uh, functions of what we call Valor. Valor is the, uh, the database uh, designed by the Education and, uh, uh, and Culture DG for the dissemination of the project. So we want to enrich the, the quantity and quality of information that we make available to, uh, to everybody's use. Uh, this will never replace uh, that kind of, uh, of direct personal contact, of course, in such, uh, in such events that we need to, to continue uh, developing. On the future of the program, uh, this is even possibly uh, uh, rather a question for our colleagues in, uh, in the Commission Services in DG uh, Home Affairs, but still I think I, I can answer the, the, the question. Um, the, uh, the proposal made by the Commission uh, and, uh, and that has been taken up quite largely by, uh, by the Council and, uh, and Parliament, let's say, the, uh, our legislative uh, masters uh, as far as the, uh, the, the, the financial programs are concerned, is quite uh, stable in the broad parameters of, uh, of the program. I mean, uh, Europe for, for Citizens has been integrated, as was uh, mentioned yesterday uh, by, uh, by Marie, into a broader program, the uh, Citizens Equality Rights and Values program. But um, the, uh, as it is now, uh, the, um, the, the remembrance term, let's say, is totally uh, preserved in the, in the future program. Uh, and uh, so, so what the future holds uh, is, uh, in terms of the, the content for the moment, is rather, rather stable uh, uh, for, for the, the, uh, the commitment, let's say, the continued commitment to work on these issues. Uh, still unknown are the figures and the budget attached uh, to this program. It's anybody's guess. Uh, what uh, what the leaders of the European Union will eventually um, uh, decide on the uh, on the amounts of the um, of the European uh, budget uh, discussions at this level of the leaders have already barely started at the European uh, uh, Council um, last week and uh, top dis top discussions will uh, will uh, start in earnest i think at the uh, at the december uh, Council, so maybe uh, maybe we'll know a bit more. But um, and for us, obviously, the the size of the envelope is important because uh, uh, already, yeah, let's say, uh, our, our program uh, can only um, uh, devote something like four million uh, euro per year to the remembrance strand, which is a bit little uh, compared to uh, all the the good quality projects that uh, that we receive. So uh, we can only hope. That um, that the uh, the envelope will be maintained. The um, the resolution uh, adopted by the Parliament uh, last month, you know, for all the uh, discussions, uh, it's uh, stirred up in terms of its content and uh, and um, and uh, very uh, let's say important uh, discussions. But uh, to look at uh, maybe very uh, 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 let's say uh, concretely can only uh, support uh, the commitment of the budgetary authority to maintain a sufficient uh, 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 budget for, uh, for the remembrance strand. The, uh, the details 
the implementation details of the remembrance trend for the future. Uh, that means as from uh, 2021 uh, uh, onwards and up until uh, 2027 <coughs> will be in the hands of the European Commission to come. So here again it would be uh, presumptuous on my side to say you know, exactly uh, this will change or not change because that would be in the hands of the, uh, of the next Commission that we won't arrive on the 1st of November as initially planned but uh, perhaps uh, before the end of the year, depending on the um, on the endorsement process through the uh, the European Parliament. Uh, so, so well, let's say the, just just to, to to summarize the basic parameters uh, as provisionally adopted by Council and Parliament are quite stable, but some uh, some unknowns on the on the budget and on the uh, exact modus operandi, depending on what. Uh, on what the uh, the commission uh, decides, because people do matter, you know, a, a given commissioner with uh, his her own you know, personality, priorities, etc., can decide or not to uh, to change uh, the the way it is done. I don't want to create, uh, let's say, um, uh, fears or uh, anxieties, but uh, but uh, contrary to. Uh, to many accusations, the uh, the European Union is not a bureaucracy in the sense that you know the the political masters the the, the that um, that come uh, and go uh, do have a, a, an important personal influence on uh, on the shape of uh, many policies and many uh, financial programs. That was a long answer. I'm sorry. Coffee break then. Yeah. <laughs>